we continue with our daily devotions in this on the names of Jesus and we come to one that maybe you wouldn't have thought of as a name or title but it's a uh, something that Jesus mentions in John chapter 12 and in John chapter 12 Jesus says this most assuredly I say to you unless a grain of wheat or kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies it remains alone but if it dies it produces much grain now in this context Jesus is him speaking of himself as a grain of wheat or a kernel of wheat that falls to the ground he he, he gives himself the picture of being a seed and we're going to look at the context of this and see the importance of it this little teaching here is uh, I think is often overlooked but we're going to go through this little passage and see why I believe this is a, a, a title of Jesus or something that he called himself and and how that translates for us so uh, if you have a Bible you can follow along and see uh, what is going on here in John chapter 12 verse 19 the Pharisees therefore said among themselves you see that you are accomplishing nothing look the world has gone after him Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead and everybody could see that it happened they couldn't deny it matter of fact they were so upset about it that they thought uh, they plotted to kill Lazarus to get rid of the evidence you can see that these uh, Pharisees, these religious rulers, had no desire for the truth, nor to follow Jesus. They were looking for political expediency to the point where they were willing to murder for it. And of course, eventually they did. But instead of Lazarus, they murdered Jesus Christ himself. And so they were frustrated with it. But not only uh, were they discovering that, that the whole world was going after them, the Pharisees said, but it wasn't an exaggeration. Others were coming to find Jesus. And so in John 12, 20, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. These weren't Jews. These weren't Jews, but they were what we would call, they would call proselytes. They were non-Jews who were believers in the God of Israel. And they came up to Jerusalem, Now they could only worship in the court of the Gentiles, but they came and worshipped as well as they, much as they could. But then it says, they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now this was a little startling for Philip. The reason why we know it was is because Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Because these weren't Jews. What should we do with these ones that are Gentiles? Yes, they believe in the God of Israel, but they're Gentiles. And so his popularity of Jesus Christ had reached beyond the borders of Israel, reached beyond the nations right around them, like Syria and, and uh, Tyre and Sidon and in these other areas and over towards the east. Now it was all the way to Greece. They were Greeks who had come, who had traveled a great distance, but they wanted to see Jesus. So Philip goes to Andrew and says, we got these Greeks, they want to see Jesus. So Andrew and Philip said, well, let's go talk to Jesus about it. And Jesus' answer was rather different. He didn't answer them about, well, tell them to come. Or not. Of course, he, uh, he had often said that, you know, come to me. So it wasn't that he wasn't going to see them, but here's what his answer was. Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now his answer was in the evidence that now, as the Pharisees said, the whole world is going after him, Jesus said, The time has come. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What did he mean by that? Well, you would think if you were, you know, in election year, an election was going on, as, as I'm doing this here, 
and elections were going on in the United States, if you were the campaign manager and it was an, you know you had lots of popularity in Israel, but now even the Greeks are coming to see you, the whole world is going after you, you'd be delighted. You'd be saying, whoa, we've got it made. Jesus, you're getting more and more popular. Let's keep this up. Let's ride the wave all the way home. Before long, Jesus will have you sitting on the throne. Before long, you'll be glorified. You'll really be glorified. Everybody will worship you. This was the hour of the greatest popularity. I mean, we have just Jesus coming into Jerusalem and all the people praising and worshiping him is just around the corner. And on top of all of that, we have this, this uh, everyone looking for him because of what happened to Lazarus. Because they saw that he was who he said he was. And Jesus says, the hours come for the Son of Man to be glorified. But he meant so different than what even the disciples wanted. The disciples were excited. You know, they were excited to a point where one of the, the two sons of Zebedee, their mother, was persuading the boys, that's James and John, these apostles of Jesus, find out, see if you can get, you know, high position in this coming kingdom. And they wanted to know if they could sit one on the right hand and one on the left in his kingdom. They were looking at the glory. They were looking at Jesus establishing a great kingdom and him ruling. And, <clears throat> of course, the apostles thought, hey, we're going to be top dogs with him. And so he says, that the hour has come. When they, the Greeks come looking for him, it's almost like it's a trigger where he says, okay, time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he says this word, most assured. Or truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat or a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So suddenly, where's he going with this? The hours come. Everybody's after you. Everybody's looking for you. Now's the time, Jesus says, for the Son of Man to be glorified. But then he says, this is the way that I'll be glorified. I won't be glorified by being lifted up on a throne. I won't be glorified by self-exaltation. I'm going to be glorified by going into the ground. I'll be glorified by dying. I'll be glorified by giving it all up. All the popularity, all the fame, all the self-aggrandizement. Friends, that is so opposite to the way we operate. Can you imagine a campaign manager hearing that? Okay, well, now it's time for me to disappear. <laughs> They'd be pulling their hair out, wouldn't they? But here, what Jesus is saying, I'm the grain of wheat. And the time has come for this grain of wheat to die. Because he says, unless this grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will remain alone. What is he saying here? He's saying that if I don't die, if I don't go to the cross, if I don't give up my life, then I'm going to be alone. Because unless I do this, no one can be in heaven with me. No one can be saved. No one can be forgiven. The real glorification comes through the cross and the resurrection, not through the political mechanizations of this world. So he says, if I don't go to the ground and die, I'll stay alone. But if I do go to the ground and die, here's what it says. But if it dies, it's going to produce much grain. There'll be much grain. There'll be much fruit come. So, and he uses this agricultural picture again, which is 
used so much in the Bible because it was an agrarian society. He uses the picture, if you had one seed, well, you could have that one seed and do something with it. But only with one seed. But when you plant the one seed, what you end up is with many seeds. Right? One tiny, very small seed of grain produces much grain. That's what Jesus was giving us a picture of. So it's, it's kind of like um, this multiplication factor. Jesus said, I have to go to the ground. I have to die. Because just like a seed goes in the ground and then it ends up producing more fruit, so must I. And that's why he calls himself the grain of wheat here the kernel of wheat. And there, the glorification of Jesus Christ does not come from um, Him setting up an earthly throne, but it comes from going to the cross. Listen to what He says next. He who loves His life will lose it, but he who hates His life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Not an easy saying. And when he says hates his life, he's not talking about you saying, oh, I'm so depressed that I want to die. No, that's not what he's talking about. When he speaks about this in this context, he is looking at the picture that he had to give up his life. He had to be willing to say, I am willing to shut it down. I'm willing to let it go. He had to give up his life so that he could bring life. So he could bring eternal life. But he wasn't just talking about himself now. He starts with himself because he, of course, is the one who did die for our sins. And as a result of his death, life comes to multitudes. Everybody who has ever will and was and will be saved it will be because Jesus Christ, that kernel of wheat, went to the ground and died. It's because he gave up his life. Because he turned his back on his life. And he lost his life. But in what he gained from it was eternal life. Not for himself in this situation, but eternal life for millions. And you, if you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior. It's such a beautiful picture that he gives here. But there is a cost involved. There's a cost where you're willing to say, okay, I am willing to give up my life to the point where I say, I hate my life anymore. I must go this way. I must be willing to sacrifice my life so that his life rises up. That's what Jesus did. He sacrificed his life so we could rise up and be saved. But not only that, I believe in this verse he's talking about you and I too. And he's saying you need to follow my example in life. If you love your life, you're going to lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That is the worldly life. That is the life that's for yourself. To hate the worldly life. To hate the life that's all about you. And instead, look for the life that you're willing to lay down that life and let the life of Christ come. The reason why I know this is because the next verse helps us to understand it. In John 12, 26, he says this, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. So Jesus spoke about himself and about him being glorified. But his way of being glorified, the way up was the way down. So by going down, then he was exalted to the heavens. But also by going down, he was releasing much fruit. He was bringing the salvation of sinners. He was bringing in a harvest. By planting one seed of grain, much grain was going to come. But then he says, now I want you to understand. He says, whoever loves his life will lose it. 
But whoever hates his life in this world, and that's the context, in this world, whoever holds on to the worldly life and wants that, that's their focus, that's their life, in the end, they lose everything. They don't gain it all. But whoever is willing to give up this life in this world and accept the life that I have for them, the new life, that means in an inward dying to self here. That's what he's speaking of. Dying to your way, dying to the world's way, dying to sin and living to righteousness. Living to serve God. The reason why I know that is because it says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there's where my, my servant will be. And so not only is Jesus Christ calling himself the grain of wheat, and we see the result of him dying and rising, but he's asking you to become that grain of wheat that's willing to be planted. He's asking you to say, Lord, not my life, but yours. He's asking you to agree with the Apostle Paul, who said in Galatians 2.20, Not I, but Christ, who lives in me. This is what he's saying. This is what he's calling us to. And I want to encourage you with all my heart and soul to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, you need to say no to the world and yes to him. To die to the world. So the Apostle Paul said, I've been put to death with Christ. But it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 and also for the believer that I die daily. The Bible says, take up your cross. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and come after me. In other words, take up your death daily. Death to the world. Death to the world's way. Death to sin. Death to that whole way of life where it's all about me. But instead, it's a life to God. God's calling you to be his servant. Anybody who serves me, let him follow me. Christian life is following Jesus. It's serving Christ. It's knowing Christ. It's dying to the world and living to God. Oh, this is the pattern that we discover. And what's the result of that? You too will bear much fruit. You'll bear fruit in your life. Jesus said, remain in me and you'll bear much fruit. You'll bear the fruit of the Spirit of God in your life. Because rather than sin coming out, righteousness comes out. You'll bear fruit in being a blessing to others. So that rivers of living water will come from your life as you're trusting God and walking with Him. Instead of walking in sin. So instead of scattering, you're gathering. Jesus said, it's one or the other. You're either a gatherer or you're a scatterer. And He promises eternal life real life is there death to self and life to God you know what's interesting about this passage most Christians even say well wherever I am that's where Christ is but here's what he says in this verse he says if anyone serves me let him follow me follow me and then where I am Jesus said that's where my servant will be Christians are meant to follow Jesus Christians are meant for wherever he is, that's where you want to be. It's not, I'm a Christian, and wherever I am, that's where Jesus wants to be. It's the other way around. He's the Lord. I die to myself, and I say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not my life, but your life. Not my way, but your way. And he says, then, him my Father will honor. Those are the ones my Father will honor. How are you doing? Who's in charge? Are you willing to lay down your life? Are you willing to be like Christ who says, Okay, Lord, it's not my life. It's yours. It's not my time. It's not my energy. It's not my... It's all yours, Lord. And as you are willing to yield to the person of Christ and say, Not mine, but your Lord. Not my life, but your life. Then wherever he is, that's where you'll be. Because he'll be guiding your footsteps. You'll be saying, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, show me. Guide me. Lord, my life's not mine. It's yours now. It's yours. That's what a Christian is. is someone who says, that's not my life anymore. It belongs to God. I have died to my way of life. And now he, it's his life that matters. 
And as that grows in us and as that's the way that we walk and learn to walk, we discover, we discover the life of God in us, through us, and coming from us to others. That was the life of Jesus Christ. And that can be your life too. So that every day we should be saying, Jesus, take me to the cross. I can't live anymore. It's not my life. It's your life. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what he did. He was at the apex of worldly opportunity. It was all at his fingertips. The whole world was going after him. And at that particular peak, he says, okay, now it's time. Time to throw it all away. Time to let go of all of that. Because this is, this is where I need to go. I need to go down so that I can take many, many up to glory with me. My friend, I want you to know this. The way up is truly the way down. It was so for Christ and it's so for you. But in this beautiful picture of Jesus Christ being that grain of wheat, oh, he is to be worshipped and praised because he was willing to give it all away. He was willing to let go of it all. Was it easy? No. No. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Was it so difficult? Oh, of course it was. He sweat great gloves, great great drops of blood. Three times he was on his face. He was weeping to his father. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he went. And he died. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead. He's opened heaven's doors. And whoever wants to, whoever is willing, to come to him and die. Die to self. Live to Christ. Will have eternal life. Oh, that's the life of the Christian. The life of the Christian is to go to the ground in this respect. It's a picture, okay? The life of the Christian is to say, it's not my will, but you will be done. And you will never regret this life. This is life indeed. I praise God for the grain of wheat that went into the ground and died. Because... Jesus Christ has borne much fruit. And I pray that my life, my life, will have the same heart, same attitude. Don't be snared by the world in its ways. Whatever it is, it's all fleeting and temporary. Let's keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. And may you, if you're not a Christian, may you discover that this is the life that God is calling you to. He's not calling you to a life where you throw a little God in your life and carry on. No death and no resurrection life there. No powerful life of Christ coming in that kind of life. Not at all. He's calling you, yes, to die to self. To say, it's not my will, not my life anymore. So repentance is. It's a turning away and a turning to. And discovering the true true life of Christ, which many have and no one has ever regretted. That's my challenge to you today. God bless you. You too need to become that grain of wheat so that you can bear much fruit. So here's a song I wrote again a number of years ago. It's called Take Me to the Cross. And it is the idea that we are to die to self, that the life of Christ may live. This is what Jesus, this is the way Jesus walked. This is what he did. And he calls you to that same life. Oh, Jesus, take me to the cross. I can live anymore. You said.
surrender is where I have to be. Everything will lay at your feet. All long enough to you, it's hot or cold, or it's no longer I. Let's live. Jesus Christ, in the end, counted it, counted it a blessing. He counted winning your soul and the joy of saints in heaven worth more than holding on to his life. May we count it much more to follow God, and you'll discover, Jesus said, nobody has given up anything in this life, even your own life, where you're not gain a hundred times more in this life and in the life to come, life eternal. You don't lose by following Jesus. Let me encourage you to go in that direction. Praise God for this wonderful call of God for us to die so that we might know even greater life. And that's what he promised, life and life more abundant. Don't miss it.